Hello, good morning. My name is Ryan. Um, just as a brief introduction, I'm one of the co-founders of Digital Health Malt, along with Dylan Attart and Stefan Batajic, who is also on stage. Um, I'm also a doctor by profession. I'm a radiology trainee at the moment. And today, together with my panelists here, Dr. Conrad Attart, Dr. Aaron Tend, and Dr. Stefan Batajic, we'll be discussing a bit about how education is taking a leap forward now through technology. Um, I will let them introduce themselves once I ask them a couple of questions and hopefully we can get this discussion flowing. So over the next kind of 20 minutes or so, I'd like to discuss a bit, um, maybe some innovations in the augmented reality aspect and the virtual reality aspect. I want to also ask your opinions regarding kind of digital versus physical teaching. And finally, maybe we can look at the future of, of health education. So, if I can get this going, Aaron, maybe you can kick us off and essentially um, maybe you can ask, maybe you can tell us a bit more about how you have used AR and VR in, in simulation training, perhaps. Sure. So I think AR and VR is um, an amazing emerging te technology that's really starting to uh, take a kind of uh, find its niche in simulation training. And there's um, quite a few areas where the technology is really becoming quite useful. So as a clinician of myself, and I'm sure there's many clinicians out here in the audience, I'm sure you will have had your first time performing a procedure on a patient. And it's a pretty scary you know, experience for you. It's a pretty scary experience for the patient, I'm sure. Um, and you know, it, it kind of has to be done, right? Because there's no alternative, you have to train. This is where AR and VR is really coming in. So um, when it comes to surgeries or performing procedures, um, VR can or AR can create that kind of simulation experience for you to practice so you can get a certain level of competency before you've even laid hands on a patient. So that enhances patient care, it's better for your training, it's also good for patient safety, reduces the risks. And there's a couple of companies out there that are really um, transforming that field. So Innovus, for example, they have a laparoscopic simulator, it's like a box um, where they can practice laparoscopic surgeries and some of you may have heard of touch surgery which is where um, doctors and clinicians can watch, watch virtual reality procedures being performed. Um, but it's not just surgery and procedures, there's also kind of um, simulation training, so with the dummy mannequin to create a kind of high uh, risk emergency scenario in a very safe setting. So, so that's something that Oxford Medical Simulation are doing quite well, um, to create a virtual patient in a virtual room where you have to kind of physically treat a patient. Yeah, that's quite interesting, and I think you're discussing here primarily how doctors or nurses or any healthcare professional really approaches a patient. Maybe, Stefan, in terms of um, you as an educator, have you ever considered using AR or VR in, in, in your kind of teaching experiences? Definitely, but uh, I personally, for example, I don't have the skills, the necessary technical skills to set up a VR environment, for example. But I know of many talented people, actually, that if we had the time to collaborate with them, then something could be done. And I really see a role for VR and AR for low frequency and high stakes situations. For example, in collaboration with AI techniques, high frequency and low stakes situations, such as a pediatric emergency. For example, emergencies in younger children. Those are situations where, you know, like you don't really have that many of them. And when you go and face them, like, oh, there must be someone senior to you at that point in time, you know, and even that someone senior might not have the most perfect experience because it's such a low frequency situation. So there's a big role, but definitely we're looking at the, the need for more technical skills, setting up a VR environment, even just setting it up and putting the information even. It takes, you know, that technical skill there. That's great. And Aaron, maybe one final question about this AR VR thing. I think you, you have some GP training, isn't it? Do you see any role in um, patient education using kind of virtual reality, perhaps? Absolutely. So for the audience, I don't know, I, I'm a GP trainee um, based in London. And I definitely think there's a role for VR and AR that's emerging uh, for, you know, often when we think of these technologies, we think specifically doctors and healthcare professionals, but patients definitely have um, a role too. So there is actually a company called Neuro Rehab VR that are using VR and AR technology um, for patients who've um, suffered from traumatic brain injury or stroke. 
and essentially using this technology to, to help with their rehabilitation. There are also some other companies out there that are using AR and VR technology to, um, for people who've been suffering from PTSD. So it's a kind of like an exposure therapy, so exposing them to the particular scenario that has caused them to have that particular condition, and by having a graded response to it, they can hopefully overcome the, the mental health issues that they're suffering from. Yeah, that's quite interesting, actually. So moving on a bit, now all of you kind of teach in some form of capacity, and Conrad, you've also kind of now taken a leap to supervise and kind of you're the brains behind the new MSc in digital health in, in, in Malta. Um, so if I can turn to you now, what are kind of your thoughts in terms of the physical versus the um, online form of education? Have you struggled at all with maybe um, th this, especially given COVID? Well, uh, we did not really have a choice at one point and suddenly we went all online. So we had a very good test bed to try out certain things. And in our environment, it gets challenging because we need to uh, allow students to experience technologies, to experience devices, to experience uh, the applied part of what we are learning. Um, with the MSc in Digital Health, uh, we are focusing much more on the practice and the theory is somehow is does there to introduce certain key aspects. We would like our students to create and therefore uh, technology enhanced learning has been around for quite a while. Uh, I must say I have uh, championed uh, when I was doing my PhD by um, trying out uh, the workplace, how on the job they could interact through a tablet application create learning objects about their experiences, sharing them among a community, and I was picking out the learning, the tasks that they managed to complete. Uh, starting from trivial things that we normally take for granted, which some people find it very daunting and they are not engaged with technology because of those problems, to experience things which we more advanced users might need. So that was quite an interesting learning curve. But today, uh, technology enhanced learning is, is part of us, and we, uh, we find different ways how to do it. Just one example is the way we are creating virtual machines. Uh, you were mentioning augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, in research, we, because we are co collaborating with institutes, uh, it's very difficult for us to just speak about the subjects and try to pass on that knowledge just through, through a conversation. So there is a big investment of how we're using technologies. Well, we've just done the purchase order this week, so yeah. we're buying the technology to be able to create this link to get professionals, which are not tech-savvy people, to experience uh, what we are leading to in the future. That's, that's quite interesting. And Aaron, I think, co-founder of CodeMad, um, so, so you guys have been probably more f f involved in online teaching rather than actual, perhaps, physical teaching, given, obviously, your, your job as well. Any, ex any, any takeaways from that end? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, for the audience, I'm the co-founder of CodeMed, which is one of the things we do is we teach healthcare professionals how to code so they can build their own digital innovations aimed to benefit patient care. And when Joe, I, and Joe, Imran, Joe, and I started uh, teaching uh, healthcare professionals how to code, we actually started in person. Now, the problem with that is, you know, you're limited in terms of you need a physical room. Um, and it, this was all happening when uh, about 7 p.m. So after clinicians had finished their work. So you need a physical room and you're limited by geography. So if someone from Scotland can't come and come down to London and, yeah. you know, get taught after work. So there was a lot of limitations from that perspective was teaching in, per uh, teaching in person. And actually we found via Zoom, there's a lot of things that we could do that we couldn't do necessarily in person. So we could have people spread all over the UK. So we've taught clinicians that are you know, up in Scotland, Wales, all across the UK, um, and simply because we've been doing this online. And there's a lot of things we can also do um, that we wouldn't necessarily be able to do in person. So we make quite good use of breakout rooms and screen sharing so we can watch, they can watch our screen when we're coding. We can also watch their screens when they're coding, give them live feedback. So it actually gives you a little bit of an edge that you can't necessarily get through in-person teaching. Yeah, that's, that's again, quite interesting. Um, different perspectives, I guess, especially given that, for example, in Malta, we're not as limited by geography, but it's kind of good to see other 
nation's experiences. So I think we've talked a bit about kind of the present and a bit about the past as well. And now I'm just going to open it to the floor the last couple of minutes that we have left, because I'm quite interested in how you see the next 10 years of healthcare. So if I had to put you in 2030, what do you think, you know, the education aspect in healthcare will look like? I'm not sure who wants to go ahead first, maybe starting from Stefan and then going back down. I think we'll be having many, many more uh, simulated patients in the sense, not just the normal, not just the model or just the, you know, just the simulation environment, but truly enhanced patients empowered by AI techniques. So literally, you will literally immerse yourself into the situation. So you would be wearing uh, an augmented reality um, uh, device or virtual reality device. You immerse yourself in the, in the situation. You will have a patient simulation. You will actually be able to interact as well using haptic devices to actually have the experience of the examination as well. And you'll actually literally immerse yourself into the situation. And then you can use even like, for example, a sim EPR, like, uh, like um, uh, Aaron has been working on, like bringing the full experience in a very safe way. I think that's what we're looking at. And we're also looking at more skills-based medical or health professional education, not simply module one, module two, module three, module four. No, it will be like a lifelong journey. And the medical, the health professional will slowly cater or design even as according to the specialty that I want to follow. So it might be that at the end of medical school, not might be like one size fits all education, but more tailored education leading to that specific specialty. Why not? Maybe Aaron wants to go. That's a really good, good, really good point, Stefan. Um, for me, in terms of the future, I think that what digital health really has for education is actually the standardization of, of the way that education is delivered for healthcare professionals. You know, so for example, in the UK, I, I trained at Oxford. Um, the way that I received my training would have been completely different from the way someone was taught at King's College London, which, I'm, which is where I'm tutoring now. You know, completely different, same, same country, completely different way that education is delivered. And we know that you know, standardization of things is key to ensuring a consistently good service. You know, that's why we have guidelines or algorithms that we follow to ensure that you know, if someone's got tonsillitis, we're giving the same antibiotic each time for consistency. And that's really key. And it's not just in the UK. I mean, you know, there's plenty of doctors from Malta, for example, that are coming to the UK, plenty of doctors from Australia. If we can standardize the way that medical education is delivered throughout the world, then you know, doctors can easily move from one area to another where there's a need. Yeah. The second side of things is um, integrating digital technology into things like simulation training. So, Stefan, you touched upon this um, when you were uh, mentioning SIMEPR. So, educate, like in healthcare, everything's becoming electronic, electronic patient records and things. We need to be able to ensure that that digital side of things is being integrated in medical education. That's something that we're doing with SIMEPR to ensure clinicians have experience using electronic patient records as part of their simulation yeah. training. So turning to you, same question, Conrad, but an, an, a small addition. So you wear a lot of hats and you're deputy dean for the faculty of ICT as well. Do you also see that maybe there will be a role in the future of educating us in, in our course of medicine? You just, it was my point, a clear point that I wanted to discuss. When we were um, preparing for the digital health, uh, one of the first things which I wanted to do is to understand what experience previous students have from the different faculties. We're about six faculties, right, that are contributing for this course, and to see what background they've got. And uh, we have a stream for healthcare, so we went to the medical and the health science faculty. And surprisingly enough, there isn't enough or a lot of mention of the digital aspect. When we try to capture that, and even when it is tackled, it's not really giving enough uh, space, uh, and not because they want to leave it out only, because, it's because of the intensity and the, the syllabus that there is, but I think there has to be extremely, a, a very strong investment that within the study units that are being lectured, uh, technology is part of them, and uh, giving more opportunities for students to see the link of how that profession or that particular expertise can be, be experienced. I think that is the major challenge. When we go to industry, we work with several hospitals, 
in our research teams, we have a number of professionals. A lot of them are still new to technology. They are very willing to participate. They are very willing. They know that technology can help them, but they don't have enough exposure. And as you know, in this area, we cannot risk. So if you are, don't grow into the subject, if you, it's not something you just say, wow, I have the package, now we have the technology. I have a computer, I have a tablet, let's start using it. It doesn't start from that. It takes time because there is a certain amount of confidence and knowledge which, which will lead to trust that needs to be catered for. So the Digital Health Masters is going to invest in this to give confidence and grow slowly uh, into the technology aspect. Do you see your kind of that you need also to have some input in the undergrad part of stuff from, from for from example, this. speaking as a doctor in our course in Doctor of Medicine and Surgery, for example? So, um, when in the faculty of ICT, when, we, when there was COVID, it doesn't mean that because we are technologists, everybody started teaching easily yeah. online. And there we got a very interesting experience. Uh, it was a very interesting workshop that is happening at university where they're trying to capture how decision makers and all the four different um, roles at university are were reacting for COVID. I was in one of the groups and I was really surprised at the reactions of different wow. decision makers on their opinion of how technology should be used within university. So there were a lot of challenges. This is, we can't just get our traditional education and plug it in online. It's not just, if I am lecturing or uh, delivering a speech or, or sharing some knowledge, okay, it's not the same, just I switch on a computer and that's it. I don't know if it works, but this is the same challenge like remote care. When you're using technology suddenly and you're not facing a patient, you can't just go on Skype and do that exercise same thing with with teaching these subjects yeah you need the proper infrastructure the proper um tools yes, so to, many to things to, to verify to ensure that the students and what concepts you're passing on is truly being shared and there are so many other things which we we sometimes take for granted because we know the subject but there are checkpoints which need to be done to ensure students are working you mentioned the rooms for example and and i i must admire the, the concept coding for doctors and and getting them you know 12 weeks is it what's it about 12 weeks, yeah. 12 weeks to get confidence in programming i meant that's that's something really cool there's some a lot to learn about this maybe one last question to stefan you have just one minute um so essentially we we're saying before kind of how you see it how you see everything in 10 years time do you think that it is important though that you don't just give the students the actual material, but that you also um, enable them to understand how the artificial intelligence, how the machine learning is, is working behind all of this. Sometimes the challenge with these projects, sometimes you don't have enough time. So I think there should be now an approach where digital head is taught longitudinally across a course. And, the, and it's a whole journey. That means even digital in all, um, in all health education and all medical education. That means if you're doing cardiology, how about talking about the digital aspect and building and knowledge building, building, building. At the end, maybe by the end of med school, you would have done a prediction model, for example. But that's because you built up your knowledge throughout the whole curriculum. That's how education works and that's how we can be become competently digital health professionals. Thanks. That's great, one minute exactly. So thank you very much for listening and we'll head down and let the next panel come up. Thank you.